Um, so hello to everyone, to anyone who I have not met. My name is Jakeem Aaron, and I am the president of the Notre Dame Black Law Students Association. And I'm very excited to celebrate 50 years with all of you all. So please give yourselves a hand. Thank you for coming. So of course, in considering the illustrious and enduring legacy of the Black Law Students Association here at Notre Dame, I felt like the best place to start was, of course, with our alumni. Um, so again, we're going to start with our alumni. And we've invited Joy Anderson, who's class of 2015, um, and the former BALSA president and current associate general counsel at Tenneco to moderate this conversation. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Joy. Great. Thank you so much. Welcome to all of you. And of course, welcome to our very esteemed panel. I'm really excited for this discussion. Um, I think we're going to have a great conversation about the legacy of BALSA and the evolution um, of this uh, illustrious organization. So um, we would love to save some time for questions. So please keep those questions in mind. And we'll hopefully have a couple minutes at the end to have a bit of an open forum. Um, so I think I'll start by having the panelists introduce themselves. Maybe if you can say your name your class here and, and tell us maybe a little bit about your career tra trajectory. So Professor King, let's start with you. Yes, hello, I'm Dwight King. I was um, a librarian here at Notre Dame for 34 years and I, I recently uh, retired in uh, uh, July of 2020. And for many years, I was the faculty advisor for the Black Law Student Association. My name is Ann Williams and first I wanna say Good evening. Good evening. And I need a bigger one than that. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. This is truly a momentous occasion. 50 years, I cannot believe it. Tommy and I are looking at ourselves and saying, it can't be. It can't be. <laughs> but anyway, uh, when I graduated, I became a clerk on the uh, Court of Appeals, 26th floor in Chicago, federal building. Then I was in the US Attorney's Office moved to 15, then moved to the U.S. District Court on 19, and then back to 26, full circle, spent pretty much my whole life in the federal building. And then I left the bench, and now I do full-time rule of law pro bono in Africa. And I'm so happy to be here and to see all of you. It's really quite a thrill. <laughs> And oh yes, and thank you, Roland. That's why I have Roland and Tommy here to help me stay on track. Class of 1975. All right, all right. Good evening, everyone. Well, Justice Ann is a extremely tough act to follow. I actually cannot believe that I'm on a panel with her. So I'm just <laughs> blessed and grateful to be in such esteemed company. So I am Tamara Walker. I am class of 2000. Um, after graduating Notre Dame, I started my career with Johnny Cochran's office in Chicago. That was a lifelong dream of mine that I was amazed to be able to fulfill. Um, from there, I became a prosecutor out in DuPage County, and that gave me the skill set to be able to start my own practice, which I did in 2004. And um, it's been a very interesting ride that's culminated with um, representing a Mr. Jesse Smollett. Um, ups and downs and ins and outs and <laughs> but you know what we got them out in five days y'all so <laughs> and um so from that it's been a lot of legal analyst work and being able to be in different arenas and I'm just looking forward to sharing my experiences with you all to show that you know the big firm route is not necessarily always the way so thank you guys for coming out <laughs> good, good evening um, nice to meet everybody. My name is Bobby Brown. I came here to Notre Dame when I was a very young man at, at 18 years old as an undergrad. Graduated in 2000 and then came back after I went and uh, dabbled in another career for a few years, uh, chasing the dream to play football. Uh, I came back and I came back for law school after um, greats like Chris Zorich, who was in school then, stayed in touch with me while I was still chasing my dream. Um, professors like um, Barrett and Matt Barrett and there, there were people who stayed in touch with me while I was playing football to say hey remember you said at 18 years old when you walked on campus you you, you intend to be a lawyer and we're gonna hold you to that 
Um, after leaving Notre Dame, I went to New Jersey, did the big firm thing, loved it so much that I started coming very early in the morning, uh, not to build, but to study for my GMAT. I decided I was going to business school. <laughs> um, um, it wasn't necessarily what I loved to do, so I tried to find that by going to business school, went to Yale, um, I've been in sales and trading, asset management, now I'm back in law at the intersection of law and finance. I had a plaintiff's firm doing securities litigation, so um, um, that's sort of, yeah. And, and then I said the football part, an opportunity to, to, to play in the NFL for a few years prior to coming to law school. I'm an 06 law graduate, proud to be here, so, so proud to be here, so proud to see 50 years, 50 years of anything as I'm about to celebrate a birthday uh, Sunday, and I'm getting dangerously close to 50. And uh, as I told somebody last night, I got a pain in my right knee 28 <laughs> years old. I got a pain 28 years old. But 50 years of anything is an accomplishment. So um, and, you know, thank you for allowing us to be here and give our introductions. But again, let's give a round of applause. A boss of 50 Woo! years. That's Great, thank you so much for those introductions. I thought we would start with Balsa's origin story to kind of remind us all of how this all started and how we got here. And there's no one better to take, to take us with that conversation than uh, Judge Williams here to, to tell us about the Balsa origin story, who's one of our founding members of Balsa. That's so so tell us about right. Balsa's origin story and, and also about the origin of Alumni Weekend. All right. So. Uh, when we started law school, because I think you have to have a little context, there were seven in our class, seven African Americans. The class before ours had had seven and two survived. The class before that with Stella Owens, there were nine. And so that we were very frightened in my class because the class before only two people were still left standing. And I had come from public schools where things were very open and it was just very different. And one of the things that was unique about our class, most of us had had a life before and most of us worked. A couple of, a couple of my classmates had been at Vietnam. Uh, Tommy had a career before. I can't remember what it was, Tommy, I'm sorry. But all of us had done other things in life so when we got here, it was a tough road to hoe. And we stuck together. And it was 1968, because I looked it up. A.J. Cooper, who was undergrad at Notre Dame, started Balsa, started National Balsa. So we knew about that. And Al Williams, who was one of our predecessors, three classes ahead of ours, talked to us about it, and we decided that we would form BALSA, along with Clark Arrington, who was in the class before me. And we needed something to nurture our souls. We needed that shared experience. We needed to have someone who knew what it meant to be here on this campus and who had lived lives similar to ours. And we knew that balsa would give us strength. And so balsa was where we would get together in our little balsa office and we had the outlines for the classes and we were in study groups together and we helped each other in times of need. And we had a lot of parties over at Roland and Angie's house. <laughs> and that helped as well. But balsa meant so much to us and I think balsa was one of the key reasons I survived here. And uh, the other thing is, Balsa also taught me, I was telling Tommy this, um, at the end of our first year, he decided he was going to run for the Student Bar Association. And I was like, Tommy, why would you, why do you want to do that? And he said, we need to be involved in every aspect of this law school. And we want our voices to be heard. And that was a lesson I never forgot. And so when we have affinity groups, we nourish our souls, we get our strength, we share our stories, we give lessons to each other, we help each other, but it gives us strength to get out to the larger world and the larger community. Mm -hmm. And Balsa was really the foundation that gave us the strength to do other things. Mm -hmm. And whatever adversity we face, Balsa said, keep going, mm -hmm. keep going, keep going. So. When we were it finished our first year, thank God, all still standing, <laughs> um, 
we said, you know, we knew about Al Williams. We said, you know, we should, we need to hear from the alumni because we need some guidance here. When we were in school, there were no black professors. There were no women professors. All we had was Kathleen Farman in the law library, and she was phenomenal. A phenomenal lawyer, phenomenal in, in, in phenomenal writer. She taught legal writing. She's the one that edited my, uh, my, trans, my uh, resume for my first clerkship. So in that environment, we needed to see alumni. So we started talking about it. You remember that, Tommy. I wonder if alumni would come back. So we had our first reunion in 74, our first reunion. And it was so inspiring to us, and we said we have to do it every year, and we have done it every year. And I have to tell you, I'm not aware of any other law school in the country that has had a black alumni reunion every year. And that's a tribute to all of you <laughs> that, have, that have kept the dream alive. I mean, that is so renewing and refreshing to hear, and that's the reason why we come back for this weekend, is to get re-inspired and re-engaged. Um, Tamara, maybe we'll start with you with a question. Tell us why outlets like Balsa and those affinity groups and those communities are so important to have back when you were in law school and, and today. Well, you know, um, thank you. You know, I actually started law school, and it's so funny that you said the numbers in your class because I started law school, I graduated in 2000, I started in 97, 98 year, and there were eight of us in the class ahead of us, it was five. I mean, it's funny that many years later that the numbers were so similar. I just was struck by that when you were speaking. So for me, um, a large part of the reason that I came to Notre Dame was, you know, besides the money, of course, <laughs> was um, the outreach from Balsa. Um, at that time, Kimberly Edmonds was the incoming president, and she reached out to us personally. I mean, like, I got a phone call from a law student who was running Balsa, and I just couldn't believe it. And, you know, she was a very powerful figure in terms of just making sure black students were provided for. And I took that kind of as a legacy. I took it seriously. And due to some kind of shuffles, I ended up being community service chair my first year of law school, and then vice president 2L year, and then president 3L year. So to me, it was about giving back. You know, it, was, it had been so meaningful to me in making the decision of coming to law school. You know, I was able to visit the schools and there was something different about Notre Dame. I really um, connected to the fact that you could talk about religion in an academic context without being looked at as different or other or less than. Um, and then on top of that, to have such a supportive, although small, um, black community, that was kind of the icing on the cake. So to come back this year and last year as I was able to um, and see how many strides have been made and you know there's a staff position now to make sure that the alumni weekend is not overly burdensome um, because the year that we put on our BALSA weekend, it was actually um, my best friend from law school and we uh, were co-vice presidents. And so we restored it to a full weekend. It had been down to like a dinner and then something at Judge Chambly's house. So we made it a full slate of events, which was tremendously huge, you know. But it also was very beneficial from the standpoint of giving back, from the standpoint of accepted students, understanding the community that we had, but also, you know, for life. To put on that type of event, to be involved on that level, that's not an experience that you get everywhere. And you can't, um, you know, you can't replace that with anything else, especially as a student. So I just, I'm very grateful for a lot of the lessons that were learned. Um, extremely excited to see the exponential growth. I was just amazed. Like my spirit was renewed after I came last year, and I'm expecting the same thing this weekend, of course. So I think from that perspective, to know that you know, for that many years. And I'm not, I mean, it, like I said, I was in the late 99s and 2000s, like juvenile, so <laughs> well, like that many years. But the numbers were, you know, didn't move that much. So to see it now is just, it's, it's all inspiring. And so, you know, from my perspective, I'm just glad to have been a little small cog in the wheel. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yes, Professor I just King. wanted to add, thing, add, can you hear me okay? Yes. I just wanted to add one thing. The, uh, we're mentioning all the many years that uh, Balsa has had the reunions. 
I think we should really thank Roland Chambly and his wife, Angie, <laughs> for, <laughs> for, for all the years that they hosted us at those events. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes. Bobby, same question for you. Do, you know, tell us why you think um, organizations like BALSA and those affinity groups are so important, and kind of tell us about your BALSA experience when, uh, when you were in law school. Yeah, I mean, affinity groups are just, you know, we talked about just having that support, having that network, having a group of individuals that have a unique experience similar to yours. Um, my first day of law school, we came in a room, one of the exercises was that we were going to do a diversity training. So I go in the room and I look around and it was like, I don't want to make the pop culture reference because y'all won't understand it. That was a good pop culture reference too. <laughs> 99, 2000, I was going to make one like, Sal, why ain't no brothers on the wall? Another pop culture <laughs> reference. Y'all won't understand. But I'm in this room and I'm thinking, why ain't no brothers on the wall? There was one other black male student in the class, Sean Seymour, and we're, do, we're about to do diversity training. There's one other black male student in the class, and I knew that brother before law school. Hmm. He was an RA getting his PhD in chemistry while I was an undergrad, and we're about to do diversity training. And I think all of my classmates, well-intentioned, pure-hearted, good people here to um, pursue their dreams in law too. While well-intentioned, amazing Notre Dame people, they can't understand what it feels like to sit in that room about to do diversity training. There's one other black male in the room. And so affinity groups are very important for us to share those unique experiences, not in a pity party, but as a way of saying, this is the obstacle that we're gonna overcome. These are the people that we're going to make sure support one another while overcoming that obstacle. Mm -hmm. And the thing that stuck out to me when, when, when Judge Williams spoke, said the class before her, there were seven and only two survived. Fast forward and the same thing happens a lot in corporate America. Mm. Same thing, fast forward and the same thing happens a lot in a lot of these large, uh, what they like to call white shoe law firms. Mm. The retention rate is horrible because there is no mentoring. There is no mentoring because people don't understand our experience mm. and we still sit around and ask, Sal, ain't no brothers on the wall. Mm. And so the brothers on the wall that I'm talking about from this movie that probably 90% of you millennials and Gen <laughs> Zers have no idea what I'm talking about, great movie. Um, but you go in these firms now and you see the pictures of the partners. You see the legacy and the history of the firms. And we're still trying to figure out this diversity training because it feels similar to that experience that I had where there just aren't faces that look like me. That's why the affinity groups are so important. In terms of my own experience in Balsa, Balsa was good to me and I was good to it. Not only would I go to Judge Shambly's house and, and he would host us, I was kind of a socialite type, you know? So. <laughs> No. A little bit, you know what I mean? <laughs> deep down, I'm an introvert, but in law school, it's deep down in there. It's deep down in there. So I was the one, I was the one throwing the parties. I was the one, um, so I gave back to Balsa. We had a good time, but Balsa surely gave to me. I was the president twice because of the history of National Balsa, and we did some research. There's a little bit of a strain in relationship with National Balsa for a few years. And when we did the research and realized that A.J. Cooper was an undergrad here uh, at Notre Dame, we really worked hard to, to get reconnected with National Balsa. And so I ran for national chair. Anytime someone phrases it that way, I ran for it. That means they lost. <laughs> but it was a close race. <laughs> uh, and so when I didn't win national chair, I decided to come back. And they offered me a position. And they well, you could be the first person from Notre Dame. And the last several years, has been on the national board. And I felt like locally, we still had some more work to do to build a foundation and connect with that national balsa. Um, um, it was an amazing experience. You know, I, I saw one of the board members here who, I don't know your mating name, so I might mess it up, Marlisha. She was Myrtle. I don't know what your last name is now. Her <laughs> husband here, too. Dale. There you go. <laughs> I knew her husband was going to say that. <laughs> but Dale now. But Marlisha was someone on that board, and we just had amazing people that I still stay in touch with. And um, 
Balsa is more than just a weekend, more than just an affinity group. It's a family, yep. and a family that's grown over several years, a family that continues to support each other, a family that every time I see these accomplishments, whether it be um, she was Crystal Clark, now she's Crystal Clark Briscoe locally, whether I, there's so many people. I would, I'm not even going to try to go down that road, but so many people that are Balsa family members accomplishing amazing things, and every time I see it, I want to just, it's a touchdown dance, it's a celebration because <laughs> I go back to that night, or that day rather, uh, that ended up in an interesting night in conversation and debate, but that day where we're about to do diversity training and there's only one black man in this room mm. that's not named Bobby Brown. Mm. And so um, I'm thankful for all the boss that has done for me. I'm thankful that you guys continue to do it. I used to lean on the alum and be like, how dare you not come back every year? And now I'm raising <laughs> kids, y'all. I can't come back every year. I, I got to leave tomorrow morning to get the basketball. I can't come back every year. But God made it such that I can come this year, and I'm thankful that you guys gave me the opportunity and the space to be here. Yes. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> I just want to add add to that that whole family and here's some family right now coming in <laughs> the legacy but that 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 family and friendship that's the thing lifelong connections yeah where you call on people when there's a crisis in your life or when there's a celebration in your life. And also, Balsa helped us get into the community. I was just thinking about this. Well, first of all, I want to name Al Munson, Willie Lipscomb, uh, Ed Lark, uh, Barry Martin, because we were all in that class, and we all helped form Balsa, and we all helped with the alumni. I just want to bow down to them. Uh, the other thing I want to say is what Balsa did was get us connected to the wider community because I was sitting here thinking, I work with the Black Cultural Center. Hmm. Remember that, Tommy? And, and we did police misconduct hearings, mm -hmm. an issue that never seems to die. Mm -hmm. And uh, the dean was very supportive, Dean Link. I remember, of course, this will tell, you know, I was 75, video cameras had just come out. Mm -hmm. The dean loved technology. In fact, he taught a technology and law course, and he actually came and he filmed those hearings. Mm. That was something that was special about Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. The dean was filming police misconduct hearings. And the dean remembered that, and the dean was the one that recommended me for my clerkship to Judge Swigert. You know? And so the connections you make with BALSA and also the faculty, these are lifelong connections. And I really think I would not be, I know I wouldn't be where I am today without Notre Dame. And I tried to transfer my first year. Mm. <laughs> Actually, I applied to Howard. Mm. And they were so slow getting back to me, <laughs> I had to stay. <laughs> and you know, now I'm like, that was God. Yes. Hand. Amen. <laughs> because, because the other thing is, you know, you are unique here. Yeah. Bobby, you saying the only one. So there's something to be said about being in a small pond yeah. where you can create the ripples, yeah. where you can connect with people so that you know who the professors are that are going to give you letters of recommendation. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has that. Yep. And that's part of the magic of Notre Dame. Yes. I think that Balsa, too, is just a great... Uh, you know, community of support for, for, yes. for the students with a shared experience. But I have to mention that I, I, uh, an Asian American student came to my office once really upset, not happy in law school, just felt kind of lost, and I recommended that she speak to people in Balsa, mm. and she did, and felt very good afterwards. Thank me very much for, for that suggestion. Yeah. That also was, uh, supported her as well. And let me just say one other thing. I forgot one. I'll be fast. So... Having formed the alumni chapter, when you look at, I look at where you all, different people are, look at what you have started in your own communities. Mm. So I moved to Chicago and, you know, meet a lot of black women lawyers and we realized the Cook County Bar, as great as it is, was not really focused on issues mm -hmm. for black women in the way we wanted. I helped start the Black Women Lawyers Association. Mm -hmm. You know, we had an issue with pass rates of blacks and I helped start the Minority Legal Education Resources, Inc. Now 5,000 people have passed the bar of all colors. Like BALSA, seeing it, that organization, like you were talking about having to do this conference, you are learning skills. These are lifelong skills. Trying to weasel out the money from the administration. 
<laughs> trying to do whatever you need itself. to do to raise money, <laughs> yeah. you may see these as great challenges now, but they're great lessons behind them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All fantastic. Oh, go ahead. I just want to add briefly that Judge Ann is being a little humble about the Black Women Lawyers Association. So what she started in Chicago, where I also practice and live, um, is a national organization that is headed by the Chicago chapter. So I just want to put that little shout out out there in terms of the power of, as she stated, connecting and coming together and having the affinity groups to make sure that, you know, needs don't go unserviced and people don't felt feel unseen. I mean, that's ultimately what it's about. Everybody wants to feel seen. Everyone wants to feel included, creating spaces that are safe for all of us. So yes. I just wanted to add that little tidbit. We are in the presence of greatness. This is a fantastic room and um, you know, great energy. So excited to be here. Um, you all talked a lot about family and connections and how being an affinity group makes you feel seen. You know, I, I think I learned from Max that I think we're up to 50 black law students. So fantastic, it's great. Um, how how can the students still maintain that community and that, um, you know, still knowing everyone's name as Balsa continues to grow, as Notre Dame continues to grow, as they continue to um, maybe not, you know, we can't have the event at Judge Lipscomb's home, home anymore because it's, it's uh, I'm sorry, Judge Shambly's home anymore, sorry, um, because of how, how big it's all gotten. So how can we keep the community as we grow? Well, I'll, I'll jump in on that. So here's what we have to do. Remember who we are. Remember where we came from. Remember the people that sacrificed so all of us could be in this room. I am a first generation lawyer. I wouldn't be here but for the struggles of my parents. First, we have to believe that. Yeah. <laughs> and we have to remember who we are, what our roots are, and, and that we could have been enslaved. Yeah. And so, but for the grace of God, we're here at this point in our lives. Mm -hmm. We have been blessed, baby. Big mm -hmm. blessings. Mm -hmm. A lot of hands reaching out. And each of us has an obligation to give back. Mm -hmm. We are on this earth. What we do, we have to share. We don't, like, I've been a first in so many categories, mm -hmm. and people ask me about that. That's true but I don't want to be the last. And so we just can't forget that, and we can't forget the people on the street, but for the grace of God, we could be vacuuming the rug in this room, mm -hmm. okay? We could be homeless, we could be a whole lot of other things, but there were people that helped us, that guided us, that sacrificed for us, just never forget, and never let, as my father told me once I got on the bench, he said, never let the black robe get in the way of your humanity. Mm. And I would say, never let your law degree, the fact that you've been to Notre Dame, you know, the people that you see at the CVS and everywhere else, in the schools, wherever you are, we're no better than anybody else. Mm. And I think we have to remember that and hold on to that and not be arrogant and share what we have with others. Mm. We have skills and you do it Whatever, you know, like you may be in the phase, like you were saying, Bobby, with kids, you know, so there's only so much you can do. But maybe in the school with a parent who has a problem and you're able to like chat with them about it. Or maybe the lady who, or the man who's cutting your hair, they have some little challenge. I'm not saying you have to just practice law with everybody, <laughs> but you know, our community, we are, we have so many people that get so screwed by the system because mm. they don't know, because mm. it's, we know. And we have an obligation to share. Yes. Yes. So keep your eye on the prize. Yes. That's how you hold on. Absolutely. And I and I just will add to that when when Judge Ann said, "Remember the sacrifices that other people made before you." Mm. We say that a lot, and I, I don't know that we really appreciate just how many sacrifices were made for you to be here. It's tough because. And you, you probably don't feel as though 50 is a big number because you know, there might be a law school down the street that has significantly more, at least in Chicago, that has significantly more black students. But 50 feels like Chocolate City compared to when, <laughs> <laughs> like you in DC, baby. Right. You, like that's, you know, I mean, to, to, to people that were before you. So I think just trying to recall that feeling um, that so many of the alum had at some point 
not having someone that they could turn to, uh, not having someone that necessarily looked like them on law review, not having someone that looked like them in that that up and coming, fast rising associate chair or associate seat at the firm you've always coveted. Like there were there were generations of people that they didn't have an example, and so just really appreciating what they did and the sacrifices they made and trying to put yourself in their shoes and on a daily basis, right? Such that when you go into the classroom, you go with a certain approach and believe in your work. You're going to get to a firm. You're going to get to a a, 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 a internship. Whatever you're going to do, some of you guys are going to go corporate America, and, and you're going to get into a room where. There are people that don't appreciate all the sacrifices made. There are people that don't appreciate the need of affinity group. There are people that don't think that you're there on your merits. And they are relying on you to have self-doubt. Mm. Trust your work. You did not get in any of these seats by just a flip of a coin. You got here because of your work. And the continuation, if you will, of what the family orientation of Balsa means for me is that every once in a while I pick up the phone and, and say, hey, man, you know, you know a, a guy, Scott Bibb was my best friend. He was a year over me. Me and Scott Bibb would have never hung out but for Notre Dame Law School. <laughs> and he couldn't get rid of me if he tried. You know, the, the family aspect of it, he didn't know I was going to do this, but I just drove up to Albany and, 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 and surprised him when his mother passed. And he looks at me at the funeral and he just starts bawling, crying. And that moment signifies for each and every one of you the connection to the current Boston members that you will always have, the connection to the alum that you have. Just remember the sacrifices and make sure that you make yourself available for that call. Mm -hmm. Make sure you make yourself available to just go support a friend, whether it be a funeral, a, a, a wedding, a, their first child being born. because. What we establish here on this campus does not need to be, in, it doesn't need to end. It doesn't need to be reserved for just this campus. It's a family. Hold on to it, cherish it, and do your part in being a good family member going forward. Mm -hmm. And I just want to piggyback off of that to say that I think the way that we maintain the sense of tradition is by maintaining that sense of tradition. You know. Um, as we grow, of course, it's going to get more diverse and more people have different interests in different ways, but we still have that connection. One of the things that was important, and I'm not sure, just Judge Ann may probably know, we had the Balsa Notebook that we worked on and we passed down and we put in our programs from our alumni weekend and all of the things that we did leading up to it. So then when I was last here, last year for Balsa Alumni Weekend, um, I asked about the notebook and it seemed like no one knew what I was talking about. And I felt, you know, in some ways personally responsible because I'm like, okay, you know, got the kids there in the room now and haven't been back the way I should, even though I'm just in Chicago. Um, but, you know, that connection was lost. But the interesting thing about it is as we were having the conversation, one of the current students was like, oh, I did see this notebook and I wasn't sure what was going on. You know, we have to maintain, it's like the African tradition of telling stories yeah. and passing things down in that way. We have to maintain what's special and what's important because as Judge Ann pointed out, not every place has this. Yeah. So even if our numbers, if we end up being, you know, well, it's probably not gonna happen, but you know, 200 black students here. Um, it doesn't matter, that's not the point. The point is maintaining what keeps us special at whatever cost and realizing the role that you all play in it. You know, when I was in school, I, to my knowledge, we had our first black president of law review. I, I could be mistaken, but that was what was told to me while we were there. And I like basically personally guilted him <laughs> into becoming more active with Balsa because he was one of those people that was just academics. That's my job. I'm here to be a student. And he and I would have debates, you know, that would go on forever about what our real role was, what our real responsibility was. Um, I created, while well, I was president at least, I don't know how well it survived, but my goal was to have an academic chair where incoming students and one else could have a resource, someone to go to, someone who had succeeded, you know, to the level of being president of law review. Um, 
and you know I basically forced him to do it. He didn't want to at all, <laughs> but but he hey he did what it, what I wanted him to do at the end of the day. <laughs> so I think it's about you know making each other personally accountable as well. Yeah. You know, yeah. and um, from my experience, I was on the trial team. You know, I was we won nationals. I was very successful. But what was important to me was we started a balsa event where we did um, a moot court, a mock trial for high school students who were interested in any aspect of law enforcement careers. We wanted to make sure that they could see our faces enacting those roles, you know, on both sides, being the judge, being the every person in the courtroom. So, you know, I think that's also a way to do it is to reach back, not just from the law school, but into the greater community, as Judge Ann pointed out. And I even see actually over there an admitting student that I spent time with last year that I see is now yeah. attending. So I think that, you know, it becomes a full circle moment when you look at it as a tradition, a connected circle that can continue no matter how large it grows. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Professor King, you know, you've kind of been our, our eyes and ears on the ground as uh, serving on, on the university faculty. Um, for a number of years and being a BALSA advisor um, for a number of years. So how have you seen BALSA evolve and kind of um, what do you see as the future for an organization like BALSA? And before he answers, can we give him a huge <laughs> round of applause? <laughs> Thank you. But you know, I have to admit that one of the things I thought when I thought about changes from Balsa, and I, and I realized I, I was they, they weren't changes. They were just things that I was unaware of. Mm. Because um, I think now, uh, uh, I, I would have mentioned that a change that Balsa's done is its whole step up for recruitment. Um, I've been, I was on the admissions committee here for, for many years. But um, Balsa would participate by calling people and letting them know, please come to Notre Dame. And that was a good thing, but I, I think that more something happened towards the end of my years in Notre Dame, but, I, but it was going on. You mentioned Kim Esmond was calling people at, at that time. And then another thing that I was thinking about was BALSA's um, sort of uh, uh, BALSA students moving into the larger student organizations. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, we've had two people, I believe it's two uh, BALSA members who've become SBA presidents. Yeah. Uh, we've had uh, BALSA students become journal editors. Um, we've had uh, uh, Tia, Tia Paulette, who they mentioned today, you know, uh, was a founder of the Exoneration Project. Yeah. And um, uh, I was also uh, here at Notre Dame, the ombudsperson for discriminatory harassment. And one time I had to meet with the um, uh, assistant rectors mm. here on campus. And I felt like I was in a law school class. And I felt like I was in a BALSA meeting. There were so many BALSA students who have become assistant rectors. So an influence in the, in the law school has, yeah. grown, has grown, I think. And then also in the wider community as well. That's fantastic. Yeah, can I just speak about you know, alliances and building and just jump off on that point. So you are not gonna practice law in a vacuum. Mm -mm. And you never know who's looking at you to see what you're doing and to see if you are hitting the mark. Because you never know who's going to reach out. And so getting into the larger community, mm -hmm. going to the beer parties, which I didn't drink beer, so I didn't, I didn't like going, but I did go to the games. Um, getting to know your colleagues is really important because you never know who's going to be the one beyond Balsa that extends a hand to you. Mm -hmm. that's going to remember you because we still are not in the rooms where all the power is. Mm. So therefore, you need a voice that knows you that says your name. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to say your name and some of these things that are happening in, in uh, firms, in corporations. And so, you know, Notre Dame gives you that excellence. And so studying and getting good grades, all that stuff really matters. But you, to me you have to get engaged in the larger world. Mm -hmm. You have to have it. So you mentioned black women lawyers. I started that. I started the Bar Review, MLER. Uh, on the other side of the scale, I taught for years at the Federal Judicial Center, every new class of baby judges on court management. I moved through the ranks of the Federal Judges Association, which is like our union. And I was treasurer for four years, and then I was president. Like, all of that matters. I was on judicial conference committees. If I had just stayed in my little, because I really was shy in the, 
I'm probably shyer than Bobby. <laughs> but, uh, and I had to work at, I really did have to work at how do you connect with people who don't have a similar background. Or like you were saying, people, even black people, we aren't all the same. But the thing is, you want to find that commonality, that humanity. There's a way that you can connect. Yeah. And now, this world, you all live in with digital everything. Mm. Before you even go somewhere, you can look people up. Mm -hmm. You can always find a way to connect. Mm -hmm. And it really matters mm -hmm. as you move through the world. It really matters, those connections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, because each of you talked about um, the milestones that you've reached and uh, unfortunately having to be the first, sometimes being the only, um, sometimes looking around and not seeing another person that looks like you and the feelings that come with that. Um, and so, you know, we're moving to the segment of the night where we talk about imposter syndrome, um, which is something that I think uh, we probably all experienced as students and feeling like uh, you were in a room full of other smart people and how do you also feel smart and maybe you know some people are still feeling like that in their careers as well. So maybe starting with with you, Bobby, uh, tell us: Have you experienced imposter syndrome, and, and what are some tips and, and tools to to conquer that when those feelings creep creep in? Yeah, and I and I sort of touched on it already. I said believe in your work, trust your work, trust your work. Um, I also talked about being an athlete. Any athlete that is going to be honest with you or if you, if you put them on a polygraph of, of some sort, I don't care how confident you are, there's gonna be a moment where you think, what if? What if I don't do this? Am I good enough? Did I work hard enough? And I think that's just a part of the, the natural being of being a part of something that matters. And so when you, when you are presented with that offer and you do look around and see that you're one of very few it, it's almost like being an athlete. It matters to you. You've put a lot of work in, but at the same time, the idea of doubt naturally can creep in. That's why I think having that boss of family, having that person that you can call is so important. My, my experience at a firm, the first firm that I worked at, um, I wanted to integrate the transactional floor. There were a lot of brothers who had worked there, including um, Peter Harvey was there, who had called me and has become a, a, a very good friend of mine. He was smart. He decided not to come back to that firm. He took the money, went to New York. <laughs> but he, kept, he, he maintained his relationship with me and is, is a, a friend, a really good friend of mine and a mentor. So I decided I was going to integrate the transactional floor. I didn't want to litigate. That's what every other brother has done when they came to this firm. Um, I want to I wanna be on the transactional floor. I want to learn how to be a part of a deal. I want to be on the deal side. And I did it. Worked really hard. But I would have this experience where uh, this one partner who ran our tax part of the transactional floor, he would walk around the entire fifth floor. Hey, such and such, you want to go to lunch? I hear him walking by. And... Every single time he got to my, my office, he just kept walking. Mm -hmm. If you're not confident, if you're not comfortable, if you don't have a network to call upon, mm -hmm. if you allow doubt to be more powerful than the trust in your own work, that can start to get to you a little mm -hmm. bit. Now I'm a little older. The irony of it, that same law firm called me several years after that and said, hey, we got this chief diversity officer role. You think you'd be interested? Diversity officer? <laughs> <laughs> I've got miles to run, diversity officer. <laughs> uh, but it was a, a, com a, a full circle moment to see that they at least have identified they have diversity issues. I give you that anecdote. I give you that story because I want you to know that, that the environment is always, it's not always going to be supportive. The environment is not always going to give you the confidence that you need. The environment is not always going to produce that, that carrot dangling there. So you're like, all right, let me go get it. The environment is not going to naturally come with a mentor. So some of the doubt that will creep in, some of, of the, the inherent anxiety around being very one of very few in a room is natural. But trust your work. Trust your work. 
And that's the part that even to this day, because I went from law, then I went to finance. And taking my Series 7, Series 63, and all of that, I'm like, I don't know. I mean, this is, I ain't been in, you know, I hadn't done math, basic math in years. <laughs> Let alone, we're doing financial models? What the heck are we doing? But at the end of the day, the same skill set that has allowed you to get to this point. If you've made it through that 1L year, they worked your butt off, they worked your tail off, they tried to scare you up out of here, and mm -hmm. so y'all stayed. Mm -hmm. Trust your work. And in the moments that you don't trust it, that, that natural, inherent self-doubt creeps in because it means something to you, trust your phone. Open it, dial somebody's number, and have a conversation in a moment of honesty and make sure that you have the network balsa and as judge ann said extended mm -hmm. allies that know that you are just as amazing as as you can possibly be dial one of them numbers and have a conversation and make sure that they get your your confidence back to where it should be trust your work go out there and take over the world there's nothing that we cannot do i know it's a bunch of double negatives but you know the gist of what i'm saying mm -hmm. stop looking in the mirror <laughs> and think you can't do it you can and you will, but it's, it's going to require you to get over a few obstacles, including your own self-doubt. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mentioned that I, not, I was on the admissions committee for many years. Uh, the, the, our duties sort of changed with time. Near the end, we didn't read every file like we did at the beginning. But I remember our, our quota was 10 files a day. And we would go through those files, reading the complete file, and we'd recommend or deny and it was always this, can this person contribute to classroom discussion? Can this person's experience contribute to the law school, law school community? And if we thought that was the case, and if we thought that person could graduate, we accepted them. You weren't accepted if we didn't think you could make it. So just always remember that. You were accepted because they think you can make it. Mm. They really believe you can make it. And imposter syndrome can sneak in, but just remember that. They thought you could do it, you can do it. Absolutely, and so this is my thing, okay. You never know, the person next to you, they could be the relative of a donor. Mm -hmm. The other person could be a faculty member's niece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This person could be admitted, speaking right to what Dwight said, because they're a farm girl from Idaho, and they wanna have people with experience on the farm. Other people, because they're from New York, Mm -hmm. and they've been in a big city. Other people, because they've been in the military, they've done this, they've done that. So I think everything is a chit. I look at those things like chit. Everybody has a chit. So if one of your chits has to relate to your ethnic background or your race, your chit is just as good as everybody else's mm -hmm. chit. Don't let anybody tell you your chit mm -hmm. doesn't count and it's not as good. And so when you deal with people who are looking at you with doubt, they are the ones with the issue, not you mm. <laughs> and what you have to do is get what you need however it is you get it and not give up you have to get what you need so i think about my first job so i clerked so so oh this will this will tell you so i was not on law review uh the chief judge in the seventh circuit called dean link and said i want to hire women law clerks there have only been one or two, and there's never been anybody black. Do you have a black woman that you think could hit the mark, that could do the job? The dean brought me into the office, and he started telling me about Judge Swigert and the Seventh Circuit, and then the dean posed this question after two or three minutes. Well, Ann, have you ever thought about clerking? So, you know, in that two or three minutes when he was telling me about that job, I was thinking about clerking. <laughs> so I said, yes, Dean. <laughs> and so then he said, well, you need to apply. I went to Miss Farman, you know, she helped prep me for the interview. I went, I had good grades, but not like over the top grades. So back in the day, the dean used to have a box next to his office. You remember that and all the news of the day. So. As it turned out, I ultimately got a clerkship. You know, there were people in my class that were like, she was not on law review. How did she get this job? You know, I kept my head up high. Mm -hmm. I know the dean could have said, no, mm -hmm. I don't have a black woman that is capable of doing this. Mm -hmm. So no, I'll give you somebody else. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you never forget, never let anybody take your glory away, take who you are. And when I say think too about where you came from, I think about my parents both with college degrees, 
okay, came to Detroit. Mother couldn't get the job teaching because they didn't give blacks positions. 12 years she worked in a school for delinquent kids and then subbed for five years and finally got a contract. My father had to drive a bus for 20 years with a degree like so many black men. He applied for a position as a supervisor. The white supervisor told him no, even though he had been a staff sergeant in the army. Daddy got angry, had enough money in his pension, went back to school. He and I were at Wayne State together, majoring in education. And it didn't hit me until he was in class with me and I had to talk about who I admired the most in a speech class. And I started talking about daddy. And I started crying. And I went home and I said, daddy, why aren't you burning down Detroit? And he said, I did what I had to do. Mm. I did it for you and your two sisters so it would be a better world for you. So I could give you opportunity. He said, nobody can take my education away from me. Nobody can take my, and he said, being a bus driver is good, honest, decent work. And one of his majors was psychology. He said, plus, I used a lot of psychology with the people <laughs> on the bus. So, you know, I think about what they faced, and I say, I can face anything, and then I'll do one more, sorry, on my first job after that. So I apply to U.S. Attorney's Office. No, I want to be a trial lawyer. Have similar experience, clerkship, as 10 people who got hired and went right to the criminal division. Hmm. I was put in public protection and civil rights. And then there were two other white women in the group and a black man. So this was, we were all put there, starting around the same time. Mm. But I would need to get my foot in the door. So let us remember that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't get what we want when we, when we want it, but we need to put our foot in the door. Mm -hmm. So I got in the position, didn't like the position, because of course, how am I gonna investigate civil rights cases? I don't even know how to prosecute theft of checks. So then I went to the supervisor and said, I really, I need to transfer. No, you can't transfer. So I had heard a guy down the hall from me complaining about writing of briefs. And I had been an appellate clerk. So I should have been in that section. And so I talked to my little colleagues. I said, you know, I'm going to go ask Bob if we can help and do some briefs. So I went in and I said, can we write, write briefs? He was like, oh my god, yes, because he had had so much trouble getting so then we started arguing in the Court of Appeals. So then I tried to get duty days so we could do arrest warrants and search warrants. I went to the chief of the division, no. Bob was deputy chief, I went to Bob. And after, now we've done, I said, Bob, we need duty days because we're not learning this and that. Well, if you asked the chief, I said, I did. And he said, no. So you know what, Bob, I need you to do that because we've shown you what we can do. Bob went on down there, he got what, he, and eventually I was a year late getting in there I was a year behind, but I got it. So the reason I told that story, you must just keep going. And you know what? If one door closes, go to another. Now, I'm not a fool. I'm not a Pollyanna. And at some point, you know, if you're busting your head against a door and it's not opening, there is a message. And yeah. you need to go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. But do not give up. Do not give up. And we sometimes take ourselves out of the game. Mm -hmm. Oh, there are eight things we're supposed to have. I have six things I'm not applying. Mm -hmm. Do you think other people think like that? No. They're like, I got six things. I'm good to go. Mm -hmm. And they apply. <laughs> mm -hmm. We cannot, you know, I mean, you cannot, you got you to gotta believe that you have it. And just like you said, Dwight, they are here because they earned it. Because mm -hmm. they deserve to be here. Don't let anybody tell you you're not. And if you go to a professor and they're looking at you, you know, with that racist whatever thing, mm. just think, you're being paid to get me what I need. Mm. You have the problem, mm. not me, and keep on moving. Mm. Yes. I, I, I had a life lesson sort of with imposter syndrome. There was a student who, she was a, a black student and she, came to me often in my office and she said, you know, I'm just, I just don't feel like I can, I can make it. Uh, she came several times. Then finally one day I told her, you know, maybe you're right. Law is not for everybody. And if you've made the decision, maybe you should just stop. And she went on and she graduated. And she said, you know, when you told me that, it made me so mad <laughs> that, that I just said, I am going to get through this. See? And she did. So, so you know, on the topic of imposter syndrome, I want to piggyback and add to what Bobby and what Joe Jane said. And actually, 
Dwight, Professor Dwight as well. Um, in addition to trusting your work, know your worth. Know your worth and have an understanding of what people sacrificed before you. Because like Judge Ann pointed out, you know, I'm sure we all have stories of people who made big sacrifices for my family. Um, my mom's father was one of the first black police officers in Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah. It was a class of nine of them. Today is his 96th birthday. Oh, wow. So that's another reason I'm mentioning him. <laughs> so very blessed to still be in full health and full mind at 96. He is the sole surviving member of that class. So when it was nine black police officers hired in 1948, mm. they had to wear different colored uniforms wow. than other white officers. Wow. They could only detain white people. They did not have the power to arrest a white man if they saw them commit a crime in front of their face. Wow. They could only detain them until a white officer arrived and decided if the boys had done the right thing or not. Wow. So that's what we come from. We come from that strength, we come from that integrity, we come from that wherewithal, we come from a never get up spirit that you have to keep in mind. So one of the things that I noted, because I also went to a PWI for undergrad, I went to Emory in Atlanta, and it was extremely racist, but I loved Atlanta. So, <laughs> but, um, so what, I, what I decided then and there was that, you know, some people made the decision to assimilate because it was easier, but I felt that Every person, every black person who goes through higher education has to make their own choice. And for me, it was at that time that I decided that I was going to be a thousand percent unapologetically me. And I didn't care if that made it more difficult. And I knew it was going to make it more difficult. And I did it anyway. And I used to wear danger educated black woman t-shirts to my most white classes <laughs> with the most <laughs> racist professors because that was just my statement. So, uh, <laughs> hey. so then when I made it to Notre Dame, it was awe inspiring because, you know, Emory didn't have varsity football, so the football thing and all of that. Um, and I knew pretty early on that I wanted to be in the courtroom and trial skills was my thing. And actually, Dean Link also, he saw our moot court presentation and he was super impressed and he came to me and, you know, like I said, I was on the trial team and, and different things that led to what I do every day today. So fast forward to imposter syndrome being on a national case. It was the most interesting thing in the world from so many perspectives in terms of how are our colleagues in common. These people, because at that time, I've been practicing 23 years, at that time, what, 21, 22? Um, people that we see every day in the courtroom, these white boys were eating up seeing us on this case. I mean, like, I can't even express to you. We have a Facebook group of criminal defense attorneys in Chicago that we, you know, talk about everything from judges to what's the procedure, you know, post COVID here. They literally, and they knew we were members of the group. They talked about us like dogs in this group, okay? So you expect it, we expected it from the Trumpers. We got crazy calls to our offices and stupid stuff on our websites and YouTubes and all that kind of stuff. But from our colleagues, I don't, maybe their strategy is confusion. I don't understand. Mm. Nobody was in the courtroom. One camera's in the courtroom. They were going off of a reporter's politicized view of whatever happened that day. No one called us and said, hey guys, you guys are doing great jobs. Mm. You know, like, do you need help with anything? Can we help cover your cases? No. They hated on us in public, in a group that they knew we were members of. I mean, that is what we faced during that two weeks, in addition to hate from the world. And you know what it did? It made us stronger. Mm. It made us more resolved. And honestly, even though we lost, um, when we got them out in five days, we looked at them and we snickered. Because it was like, you could have been a supportive ally. You could have been a colleague who was appreciative that he didn't hire somebody from an outside jurisdiction. He trusted one of our own, mm -hmm. you know, but instead you wanted to be talking noise in this group for, you know, basically to hurt our feelings. There was no, really no other way. But what that showed me was that instead of people focusing on achieving their own heights in their own version of whatever their professional best was, they decided to instead spend their energy trying to, unsuccessfully, but trying to tear down the very people that they spent decades practicing with. Yeah. And I felt like that was the lesson to be taken from it, you know? And in order to be able to compartmentalize and, and honestly not care about all that, we even had somebody, we had someone who did a hashtag on social media the day we lost 
stating uh, that uh, he should have called this particular lawyer, who also was a black woman who did that. So <laughs> it just, it was, it was such an interesting thing. And what's funny, the same group that had been talking about us like dogs, tore down this black woman for that hashtag, so then we end up being in the position of defending the system. <laughs> So it was, it, was, it was very instructive as to human nature. Mm. At the end of the day, unfortunately, people are going to disappoint. Yeah. People are not gonna <laughs> rise to the challenge. And what you have to do is understand that your worth got to you to where you were, the judgment call that brought you to where you were, and understanding the lessons of your ancestors and being able to take that and understand that you are just as valuable, like J. Cole said, nobody's life is better than yours. Yeah. <laughs> trusting your work and knowing your worth. To me, if you can put those together in a way that doesn't drive you insane, you've accomplished the goal. And the other thing is too, this whole, you know, different things I've helped start it. You know, I believe in the power of one. Mm -hmm. One person can help change the world. It may be a little baby step, but what you do is you get other ones and then you join together. And one of the things that Balsa teaches you is how to get other ones in your circle because we do nothing alone. Yeah. We do nothing alone. And so knowing that you can have, that's what I mean too about keep your eye on the prize, like just connecting with people on a level that makes sense to them and not judging. Yeah. You know, we can't, you know, not negative, like because there are people that do things for different reasons and they're in for different, at different times in your life. And like they may have kids, they can't do this, but they can do, like you have to like not judge people. And that, that the power of one, though, you have to remember that. When we started the Bar Review program, I, you know, I had heard about this great program at Northwestern for black students run by Ron Kennedy. It was the same year I took the bar. So I met some of the Northwestern people. I had been in the, we were in the commercial course, and I said, ooh, can you see if I can get in it? And, he, and King, he, Kennedy said, no, you went to Notre Dame, not Northwestern. And he had a, and so, but two years later, I'm in the U.S. Attorney's Office, a guy from Northwestern comes, a black guy, I said, is Kennedy still doing that program? He's like, yeah. I said, it's still just Northwestern? He's like, yeah. I said, well, he needs to expand it for all law schools. So I said, will you introduce me to him? So, you know, I went in Kennedy's office, you know, I said, ooh, this is such a great program. Can we expand it? He said, no. <laughs> he had a 100% pass rate. He didn't know me from the woman in the moon. Who was I? I said, well, look, how about you train some of my friends on how to teach it? Because all it was was you, not all it was, but it's like taking exams under simulated conditions, and then you come back the next week and the tests are uh, corrected or whatever, and you have discussions. And so it gets you in the habit of taking the bar review. And for some of us, you know, that panic that goes on, I mean, there's a strategy for the bar, timing, a grid, all this kind of stuff. Anyway, I said, if we, if we get non-Northwestern students and we get the same pass rate as the Northwestern students, can we talk? And we did, and we created MLER. So you gotta find workarounds, mm. and you gotta get people who, have, who believe like you believe, and never forget that you have power. As difficult as what it is going on in the world today, and it's a whole lot of difficulties. You have power, because the training you're getting to learn how to think, to be strategic, to build, to be methodical, that's going to pay off in your future. That pays off. Yeah. And, that, and that's interesting um, that you talk about uh, having power. And, and I kind of want to talk about what is both of our power and responsibility as alumni. Um, you know, we may not have a job to offer. We may not be in the position to offer a job to a law student. Obviously, that's the, that's the goal, is to help somebody with their career. Um, but outside of that, what can and should we be doing as alumni of this university to you know, bring up the mindset of each one teach one, even if we, we don't necessarily have you know, something as material like a job to offer a, a student? Um, that, if, if we're really going to embrace and embody the idea of family, I think the answer is just, it gives itself. What you should be doing is what you would do for family. And my family, I'm just gonna talk about my family for a second. <laughs> I got some cousins that love to call me when they got bills due. Mm -hmm. 
I don't love them any less. All I got to tell them, no, I got to take care of my own family. Mm -hmm. All of us have had those cousins. You don't love them any less. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be students that call you for a job when you don't have a job. There's going to be someone in that firm that wants you to, to help and you're not in a position to help. Mm -hmm. And I, I joke about my family calling for the money, but it, it's similar in the sense that Every law student has to go through the normal channels to figure out how to get their job. If you're in a position to at least answer a phone and say, look, I don't have the job, but here's what I did mm -hmm. to get mine. I don't have the job, but if I were you, I looked over your resume, you might want to do this or that. Spend, spend, spend the time. Mm -hmm. I don't have the job to give you, but to be honest with you, your background, only because I've been doing it for... At this point, I'm not going to give my number of years. I've been doing it for so many years. I would suggest you maybe look into this area of law. I don't have a job for you. But if you will, spend 15, 20 minutes on the phone with me. Let's do like a, a little simulation. Let's go back and forth. Let me help you through what you should be answer, how you should be answering these questions. I don't have a job for you. But I want you to call this person. Just tell them that I told you to call. The, the exact same no, no, I don't have a job for you. Several different follow-ups, several different efforts that you can make, several different responsibilities that you find yourself holding on to and saying, I'm obligated to do something for someone because someone did something for me. Mm -hmm. And the family component of this requires it. Mm -hmm. Even my cousins that I say no, nah, man, I, I, I know it, that sounds like a real high phone bill. It really does. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, but I'll talk with them. And maybe you could go without a phone for a little bit. <laughs> 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 but am I saying no? They are no less of my family. And I think that we've got to approach it that way. No, we, we can't solve everything because there are so few spots and certain opportunities. And the truth of the matter is, by trying to help somebody else, you don't want to lose your opportunity. But you do want to make sure that you help them in ways that are beyond just the give you a job. Yeah. And I think that all of us can do that in different ways. All of us can do that by just looking over a resume. All of us can do that by doing a little quick Q&A. All of us can do that by saying, I got this person on my phone, and I know they used to work there at one point. I tell people all the time, if we're connected on LinkedIn, my contacts are your contacts. Go after it. Now, don't be, tell nobody that I told you that they was going to give you no job. Don't go that far. But you can very easily say, hey, you know, I saw you're connected with Bobby Brown. We happen to be friends, or we happen to have Notre Dame in common, you know, um, I know that he was doing some stuff in entertainment law. Whatever it is that you start the conversation with, that's on you. But by all means, whatever I have, you have. Mm -hmm. And I'm challenging everyone in here to have that same approach. Whatever you have, just make sure that our community, the family that is Balsa, the people that are going through those very, very, very um, difficult roads less traveled, because they are the first or maybe the second, uh, or whatever the case might be, roads less traveled, Make sure that you avail those things that you have, whatever it might be, to our family. Mm -hmm. So, and can I just talk about leadership? And one of the things that you can learn here at Notre Dame, I mean, the skills you're putting together help you to be leaders. And you know, if we don't lead, who's going to lead? Mm. Okay, so if we don't stand up, so different organizations you're in, your church, your church family, you know, is there a legal, because uh, I'm going beyond just helping each other in career, you know, does your, does your church have a legal ministry? Is that something you can start mm. so you can help people? Mm. What's going on in the school? Mm. You know, what is it there, there, there? What's going on in other organizations you're in? What about your bar associations? Is there some way you can drive the train to help somebody else? So one of the other program I started was just the beginning. Uh, an, uh, uh, pipeline organization. So we focus on high school kids. We do summer camps across the country because 
because I was first generation. I didn't have a clue. I rolled in here the day before classes started, called Willie Lipscomb, said, I'm in the dorm, it's good. And Willie said, Ann Claire, have you done your reading? <laughs> to which I said, Willie, tomorrow I will get the syllabus, I will buy my book, and then I'll do my reading. He said, no, Ann Claire, you're in two classes with me and get over here. And Willie had to explain everything because he had gone through Clio. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know how the cases worked. I mean, I, he had to explain all the terms and everything. I'm trying to figure out what's the holding like. All oh, this seems like law to me. What is this? <laughs> so I never forgot that. And so as a judge, I was able to pull all the law schools together in Illinois. And for the last, I don't know, seven or eight years, every admitted student in Illinois that we think needs help, not every, I take that back. Every school gives about 15, gives us 15 kids, usually of color, first generation, and we do a three-day jumpstart orientation. So think about where you, you know, are there law schools near you? Do they have a program like that? Like, you gotta start thinking about structural, institutional things to try to drive some change. Mm -hmm. And so belonging to these bar associations and seeing what are they doing? Or it could be like a prison ministry, it could be helping women that are victims of domestic violence. I mean, think about what you, within your sphere, what you care about, how you can make a difference, and how you can help change the world. Because again, we go back to the power of one. Yeah. And, the, and the ability of Balsa, and being able to work with Balsa as your small microcosm, and then branching out into the university to the rest of your class, that's what you need to take into the world. Absolutely. And I agree 100% with Bobby, all those different things that can, we can do for each other. I would take that um, uh, each one teach one, just even beyond just say help people. I, I was inspired by my great grandmother. She lived near a Western Michigan University and she had a big house and she would rent her rooms out to black students there because they couldn't stay in the dorm. Mm -hmm. So even though they weren't welcome in the dorm, they were welcome in her house. And that inspired me and so I just decided that I wanted to welcome every black law student who came to Mm -hmm. to the law school by having them come to my house mm -hmm. uh, once or twice a year at least. And um, I thank my wife Mary for helping us do that. It just made me feel good. It's a way to pass it on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I yeah. think, because um, I'm also in the phase with young kids, and it, it does become more difficult. There's mm -hmm. no reason to pretend that it doesn't. But, you know, like Judge Sand said, I'm starting a mock trial at their elementary school and, you know, done it before, but I had to take a break. <laughs> so now I'm ready to be able to get back geared up. I think it's finding the level that you connect on and what pa you're passionate about, you know, um, in addition to helping those who reach out in whatever way you can. Because I've definitely done the same. You know, I may not have a job, but I know this person. Let me reach out. Let me look at your stuff. I think that that's excellent advice. And I, I certainly have put it into place in ways that have helped people. Um, in addition, you know, giving people experience, even if you can't necessarily pay, um, you know, giving people that experience. Some people just want to come and watch you. Some people want to understand and absorb what a day is like. You know, I've connected people who may want to do uh, family law, which I hate family law. So, but I, I have a bunch of people to call, like, hey, this person wants to do family law. Um, you know, connect with them, send them an email, offer to take them to lunch. You know, basically give them an introduction of how Judge Ann said the connections work and how the game is actually played. Mm -hmm. I think that's what gets lost between school and practice is how it really works. It's really about connecting with people. It's really about putting yourself out there, which can be difficult, of course, you know, but you gotta uh, have that confidence. That's where the imposter syndrome comes in. You gotta be able to get past that to say that, you know, this is something that's important to me. I need this. I can't be ashamed to ask, you know, and I, I certainly have been guilty of that. Um, and actually judge and helped me early in my career when I was scared to ask to be able to, you know, I, I would call her and be like, hey, I, I really want to come to this uh, activity going on, but I don't have the little $200. I was just getting out of school, you know, and oh, well, let me call this person. I can get you on the list. I mean, that's that's real life, mm -hmm. you know, and I think we have to uh, keep in mind that what we may take for granted, what may be simple for us is a big deal to somebody who's in school or just getting out of school. So yeah. I think that that's how we do it. Yeah. Great, great words of wisdom from our very esteemed panel. Um, maybe time for one or two questions. We're, we're running a little bit short on time. We want to get you all to the game watch. Um, so a question over here. Uh, 
Hi. Um, thank you for an um, awesome panel so far. My name is Jamal. I'm a 2L. Um, a lot of the panel has talked about how much BOSA has given you, how much BOSA has contributed, and how great it was. But I think one of the things I want to talk about is, or ask you is all, is, is can you talk about a time when during a group you had Discord and you weren't getting along? <laughs> And <laughs> and how you and how you and how you got through that and, and you know what the outcome of that was. I think there were balls of weekends when the students were upset that they didn't seem to get the, the support they thought from alumni, mm -hmm. and there were balls of weekends when the alumni were disappointed with the students for not. Um, asking them for, for help. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, w I was just trying to think of, you know, we had at least one guy in our group. We were in the study group with him, but he like never affiliated with anything we did. And you know, like there's some people after you try and try and try, you say, you know what, we not gonna put you over here. <laughs> and you try to find a way that you can have common ground and also bringing in faculty yeah. can be helpful. Somebody trusted like Dwight. Like I think about black women lawyers as an example. I'm a founder there. As you know, we've had, because I don't know how close you've been with BWLA, but sometimes we have some very rocky times. Uh -huh. And so what happens is I always tell them, look, call us, call on the elders when they're rocky yeah. times. Because yeah. then you can have somebody come in with a perspective yeah. that helps get the thing untangled. Yeah, because somebody's got to be like the, quote, peacemaker, the mediator. There's got to be somebody that you need to No, you got to find that person if it's a faculty member, it's alumni. Yeah. And I know we would, of course, I'm going to put Judge Rowland uh, right here. But the point is, you can call on others. Yeah. But, you know, they're just, you try to get people to work with you and do things. And then you, like, find out who's dependable and who's not, Okay. So you don't, don't go to the people that are undependable. I mean, every, this is not, you know, everything is not 100%. Everybody's gung-ho going forward. I think because there were so few of us, we got along, I thought, yeah. pretty well. Yeah. Because there were few of us, and it was, and, uh, and again, didn't I say all of us had worked outside of being, and so there was, to me, I could be wrong, but I just don't remember us having a lot. I just remember other organizations that I've been in <laughs> that have had problems or whatever, and we just have to try to work through them, and you try to get somebody who's reasonable to help you work it out. I mean, that's the yeah. best I can say. And everybody's not going to come to the party. And you just have to accept that, and you have to accept the role, what people have capacity of. Yeah. And don't overcharge them when they don't have the capacity. Like, listen to what people are telling you and don't be, I don't know, I wanna say skeptical or something. Try to give people the benefit of the doubt is what I'm saying. And if you've done that a few times and there, you gotta write them off. I mean, that, I mean, it's mm -hmm. kinda cold, but I believe in that. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you're not with me, then you got, you know, we can't work it out. I give it a lot of time and I have a lot of patience. Uh, but at some point, you have to move on, but, but use, like Dwight and others and people who can help you? My, my one example, uh, well, two quick examples. One was about moot court in the National Balsa competition. We had, um, actually, the other brother in our diversity training mm -hmm. wanted to be in moot court. He was ideologically um, different than most of the Balsa members. He's a member of the Federalist Society. His social circles weren't the same as most of us. And there were people that, well, we don't want them in, to be a part of this moot court. And for me, it was a, a moment of, look, I get along with everybody. I'm throwing all the parties. We kicking it. <laughs> but I had to speak up and say, we're not a monolithic group. We're not just, because if that's who we become, then right. we're doing they, whoever that is, the opposition, the enemy, we're, we're doing their work for them if, yeah. they, if we just become one person, if we become one type. We, our, our, the people who made the sacrifice, our ancestors, our predecessors, fought for us to be in these seats, to have the freedom to be the student that we want to be. 
And so I fought very hard for him to be on that moot court team. And um, he's now a professor at Vanderbilt, killing it. But a lot of that started with him killing it in that moot court competition. And it was, I think, sort of an awakening for that group to say, yeah, we have this affinity group. We have moments where we plan spades, we plan dominoes and bid whist, and it's, it's, our, it's our culture. But our culture has to afford uh, some leniency, and, and we gotta be liberal in the sense that everybody is not the same. The other one was at uh, Midwest Ball, so we were uh, competing for uh, Midwest Chapter of the Year, which Marlisha reminded me that we won, but we stayed up all night doing that scrapbook. I don't know if they still do that scrapbook, but that scrapbook, they do. Uh, it's probably digital now, I'm no, showing my it's... age. Um, but we worked all night. And so when you go up that, that late and you're not getting a lot of sleep, and it was myself and there was another person who was a year younger, one of the uh, Balsa young ladies who also had a really big personality. We just, we had a real big argument that night. And it took a long time for us to mend that, that, that sort of division that was created that night. And, you know, I ended up apologizing because I said I was, it was late in the night. I was the Balsa president. I said some things I shouldn't say and I'm sorry. Not in front of everybody, behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. I just saw that person, and I was just telling Marlisha, walking, uh, I was getting off the subway in New York, and I had a mask on, and she looked in my eyes, and she was like, and I looked at her, and was like, Bobby? And I want to think that we argued and was in each other's face so tough that night that that's how she remembered my eyes, because it was one of those <laughs> moments where we was about to go at it. But, hey, if we're going to be family, let's, let's be honest here. You don't always get along with everybody in your family, but you're always supposed to love them. And so yeah. through love, we got through it. And I, I wouldn't trade it for the world, both, in both examples. Yeah. Thank you. So Bobby left off on what I was going to start with, which is the concept of family. So I definitely, as Balsa president and as Balsa vice president, we had, we had some strife because uh, Kiana over there laughing. You, she remembers. <laughs> um, so actually, my third year, I was not only Balsa president, but I was also um, captain of barristers. So I had a lot on my plate. And, you know, there was a rift. Like I said, Kiana's over there laughing because she knows what I'm about to say. So there was a rift when we were, we were two L's, y'all were one L's. And we decided, like I said, my, I wanted to really focus on academics and making sure that aspect was supported. Um, and we felt that that was what was most important. And we did not have an orientation dinner. And that was not very well received by the one L's. And it led to like a two year back and forth situation. But ultimately, the, the takeaway from it is it was a family situation. We ultimately did understand what they were saying. Um, but, you know, it was a growing pain that I think was instructive. And it kind of illustrated the point that you have to have a balance. And I think when you're on Balsa eBoard, you can start to feel attacked and like, well, if I do this, then these people are not happy. If I do that, then those people are upset, you know? So it, it has to be a balance. You, you have to, you know, at some point make a decision. It, it, you're not gonna please everybody. It's just what it is, you know? But at the end of the day, family has beef and comes back together. Family has arguments and, you know, still breaks bread. If you keep those concepts in mind, you'll get past it. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you to our panel. It looks like we're wrapping up. We still have an event going on, so if you guys could step out for just a moment so we can wrap up. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Max, do we have time for one more question or should we wrap up? We're fine, okay. <laughs> okay, are there any other questions from the audience? Don't be shy, because people walked in, we good. <laughs> oh, there's a, oh, there's, oh, he's waving. Oh. <laughs> y'all, look at y'all, future lawyer in the back, my son, Adam. The one in the hat is Noah. He's a future, probably scientist. <laughs> world dominator. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? I have a sure. So you're celebrating 50 years of Balsa. We are, you want to pass the mic? Yeah. 
as I understand it, you're anticipating having 90 alums at the uh, banquet tomorrow. That's power. Um, that's a, a brain trust that uh, oh, oh, it's needs. 90. Tommy, it's 90 people all together. Okay. But not 90 alumni. Oh, okay. Well, regardless, we have a significant number of alumni around this country. Um, we, should we not be in the process of putting together a directory um, so that we know where the alums are, what their expertise is, so we have, uh, a, we can call on folks um, if we have an issue, if we end up in the city and we want to know what is this judge like, um, what are the prosecutors like, um, what f firm that I'm going up against, uh, their uh, top lawyers, you know, get a read on those uh, issues. How can we do that? Mm -hmm. Well, we do live in a digital world, and you did find a way to get everybody invited. So it's not that much trouble to me to do the spreadsheet. And for, uh, you know, for us to, all of us that are here, easy to start that right now to get the list going. The problem in the past has just been, because everybody is a student, they're trying to get all their work done, and then it's a transition, and where do the records go, and things get lost, and then trying to, but now, we actually have a database, Max. Isn't that something that, and we have Max. <laughs> <laughs> we have more resources now than we used to to keep up with alumni. All of you obviously got here today because we were able to reach out and connect to y'all. Um, I think what we really need is alumni making the point that they are willing to engage and understanding that we are here in a way that maybe we haven't always been able to be here. And so there's room to support, there's room to give back. And if you're open and interested in that, we can expand what we're doing, you know, we don't always know what people are welcoming. And so we can send an email about a 50th reunion, but we can't necessarily send an email about, hey, this job opportunity is opening up or this student is looking for this thing without maybe somebody saying, take me off the list, right? So if people are saying that this is an interest that they have, they want to support students, they wanna be here, let us know that and we can create the structure to make that happen because I can tell you that these students are very interested in connecting with you, getting to know you, tapping into your networks, learning from you. And so if this is something that everybody's open to, we can certainly make it happen. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, great. Right answer, Mike. <laughs> good answer. Max, thank you for all you do. Yes. And that is the perfect note to end on. Um, so we're now going to have the game watches. It still Except, here? can't we not give a huge round of applause to our <laughs> very <laughs> 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 So and thank you to you all, and thank you for fantastic. A lot of a lot of gems were dropped. So I hope you all are taking notes because I learned a lot. So is the event here, Max? Or are we? Yeah. Yes, it is in here. But again, can we just give one more round of applause for our awesome panel? Wasn't it so special? Of course, as was mentioned throughout the panel, we're grow we've grown to almost 50 students here, and I don't want us to lose this sense of community and our appreciation for the legacy. So these are the strong shoulders on which we stand. So we really do appreciate all of you all. So one more hand. One more hand. <laughs>